Okay, welcome everyone to uh, this question and answer session for session 14 of the online Exarch uh, conference for 2021. I have all our speakers here for question uh, for session 14 who are anxious to answer all of your questions that you have for them. We have a first question here is for Marco. What is generally the background of your volunteers? Uh, do they already have experience in house building or in archaeology? Thank you for the question. Um, so the background of our volunteers is, um, it varies to be fair. We've got uh, volunteers who are not absolutely from, a, from an archaeological background. Instead, they're members of the community, of the local community. Our museum uh, is located in basically a post-industrial area outside of Newcastle in a little town called Jarrow. And uh, some of our volunteers, they come from uh, very, very different backgrounds. We, it's important to mention that we um, are uh, one of the 10, we belong to one of the 10th most um, uh, unprivileged communities in the UK. So we can have uh, very various people from very very different uh, backgrounds which is something I do really like because um, we then offer uh, the opportunity to get in touch with uh, archaeology with activities that uh, otherwise they might have not been um, considered maybe by, by uh, certain members of the community um, but we do also have um, highly skilled volunteers highly specialized volunteers uh, possibly ex-visitors, we do have architects, we've got obviously an army of PhD students from Newcastle University, um, we've got um, archaeologists who uh, are, for example, uh, at the moment they're not working on field, so they enjoy to volunteer uh, for us. In terms of um, experience in timber building, no, we do not have, neither me or my volunteers, we do not have any experience yet in timber building. So, the, but we are starting in, in um, uh, now in April, on the 17th of April, we're starting our first building uh, project. We are rebuilding uh, our Gruben house. So um, we will be trained by an experimental archeologist uh, from New Heaven Copies down the south, Mark Cox, who will come, deliver a workshop, deliver a training, and hopefully will uh, start to acquire some basic skills to then proceed in our experience with timber buildings. Uh, all the buildings we've got in our museum, they were built in the 90s, basically, uh, from the previous uh, management of uh, what was called Beats World, and now it's called Jarrah Hall, uh, our museum. I hope that answered. Yes, no, definitely. Actually, just following on from that, so you mentioned that the previous ones are built in the 90s. Do you see a big difference in how you would build them now based on how they were done in the 90s, either due to, I don't know, changes in health and safety regulations or uh, other external influences? Um, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, so considering that I'm not a, a proper expert in parlor architecture, and this is really, even for me, it's, it's uh, a first experience um, working with volunteers, working uh, at this level in, a, um, in this sort of British institution, such an experimental archaeology open air museum. So I'm looking at all the policies, all the risk assessments, uh, literally now while I'm uh, finalizing this, this new building project. Um, in terms of, of policies, um, I, think, uh, um, I think even when they were built in the 90s, there were, there was, it was paid a lot of attention to risk assessments and uh, um, the way they were built. For example, our Gruben House, was built with a set of very non-historically appropriate stairs uh, with a handrail to allow everyone to sort, well, not everyone clearly, uh, to facilitate uh, some of our visitors uh, in the access of the Gruben house. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the discourses uh, around accessing these buildings are now in place because we are redeveloping the village, trying to uh, you know, make it more accessible. And from a shape uh, point of view, from a, um, you know, um, the way they were built back then, I would say that, for example, our big building, the Thurlings Hall, 
it was built following pretty much Peter Reynolds' um, guidelines in terms of um, sort of uh, simplified interpretation, not you know uh, basic interpretation without adding too much to the project. I think nowadays um, it's important that uh, the museum uh, makes some choices on interpretation and is um, uh, to add a certain level to these buildings because they are, um, I think uh, these kind of structures are on a spectrum uh, which goes from pure experimental projects to uh, tools that the museum uh, uses for public engagement and public um, education. So um, I think a, a good selection of, of interpretative choices can be made uh, such as, I don't know, um, decorating the buildings, which is something that in the 90s was absolutely out of context. Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, good uh, answer. Uh, our next question is for uh, Anita. When creating the reference collections, how do you account for possible taphonomic processes? Yes, we, we, we do that, at least I do that in my research, and I've seen other people at the Center do the same, exactly by experimental archaeology, by trying to reproduce the processes that take the material to the type of record where we found it. For example, I, I work a lot with dental calculus, so if I am looking at uh, starch granules that I want to identify from food, I try to produce a reference collection where the material has been sourced, like you have seen in the paper, for example, I create a flower. Um, with the weeds in it. And then I experiment with cooking, with roasting, so that I can get an idea and um, of how this would look in dental calculus. Most recently, uh, there is also the option now of butting material into saliva uh, to see if the, how the saliva actually interact with the starch, for example. There are a number of papers there. So the tough, depends by what context you are dealing with. In dental calculus, our taphonomic context is, for example, the way material becomes incorporated into dental calculus, where it's then preserved as a snapshot. So the best way in this case to reproduce the phonomic processes is to study material from the raw material to the way it enters the mouth, the way it interacts into the saliva, and then how we may be incorporated into calculus. I hope that this is clear. No, yes, very clear. So uh, out of curiosity, are you then physically chewing the the pieces to see the saliva and uh, that that influence yes it, it's an, um, it's not just me many researchers have done that and in many reference material is chewed cooked uh, um, yeah that is uh, is possible in um, I would like to point this out, that if you are going to do this type of research and you are not, <clears throat> for example, I did research of this kind in Italy, in Adilo Fascial Sciences, and we do this also in York at the Year Center, uh, we need an ethic agreement. So I don't want the people think that they can just go and use human saliva in normal experiments. I would like to encourage people to consider all the ethic implication, but we do that. We have um, ethic agreements for these type of studies as well. Yes, that's an important point, something that was mentioned in an earlier talk as well, I think. Okay, thank you, uh, Anita. Very interesting answer. You're welcome. Uh, our next question is for uh, Anya, uh, from Amy, actually. Amy, do you want to ask it yourself, perhaps? Sure. Yes, uh, I was, yeah, it's a fascinating paper. I, I thought, you know, the whole sort of Chain Opertoire sequence was was brilliant and the way you investigate it, you know, is really interesting, all the different actualistic experiments that you carried out. Um, just thinking about the sort of the debris that, that was created when you were making those fish hooks and saying that you do um, get evidence of this in the archaeological record. I was wondering if you have sites where you see a concentration of fish hook manufacturing activity happening. So you're getting areas which look like sort of spatially segregated for this kind of crafting activity. And if you could talk a little bit more about the whole production uh, and the relationship to production and spatial uh, patterning. Thank you, Amy. Uh, it's a very, very interesting question and, uh, and one that we should uh, definitely work more uh, into studying. Uh, I think um, it's a bit 
the sites are a bit uh, of a different char uh, variable character, uh, but you have uh, quite clear evidence of uh, working spaces uh, in several cases uh, where you have, you know, dwellings, hot structures, uh, where you have evidence of fishhawk production going on uh, inside the hut. Uh, and that fits uh, sort of more into a general uh, distributed patterns that you find on many of these uh, mesolithic sites, uh, that you have these sort of mixed uh, crafting spaces. Uh, associated with huts. But then on the other hand, many of these sites are also uh, uh, interpreted as uh, maidens. Uh, so there you have more, uh, you know, uh, a mixed in situation, often with uh, fish hooks and debris uh, alongside, uh, you know, animal bones and uh, other types of debris. Uh, and often it's, um, a lot of these sites you have a uh, uh, burnt material. Uh, what is uh, preserved uh, is burnt, and you can also these these techniques that we have uh, uh, recognized and th these specific types of debris that uh, uh, comes out of making the fish hooks. You can even identify that on burnt bones uh, because it's very characteristic. So I also have several examples of uh, uh, of sites where where we have sort of identified uh, fish of production just based on those uh, bits of debris, actually. Uh, and then a, th a third kind of site uh, is the, the sort of more mixed um, sites that you find inside rock shelters along the coast of Western Norway. You have several of those and, and there you ha have a more difficult situation because they're excavated uh, many years ago and uh, it's not always very well documented, uh, the context and, and whether they represent you know, a working space or more a maiden space. And you have several faces you know, on top of each other and so on. So yeah, it's a little bit mixed. That's, that's, that's fascinating. I think we might have to get in touch with you. Um, I think uh, Jess Bates, who's here, is uh, working on um, this particular question, but in relation to flint tools, looking at crafting areas at Star Castle, I'm sure Jess will have have a follow up email for you at some point in time. That's really interesting. Yes, please, please do. That would be very interesting. Uh, and I, and I think also the combination of uh, uh, we, we haven't been doing useware analysis so far. Uh, some of the fixtures are not, and the debris is not that well preserved. Uh, you know, it has most uh, eroded um, surfaces and so on, but I think maybe some of the, the hooks and the debris would have potential for that kind of study as well. And of course, yeah. also to, to study whether the flint tools that you find uh, alongside the hooks, whether, whether they have been used for yeah, that was kind of that was going to be my other question, actually. That was, is yes, exactly that. I'd be really curious about the the microwear traces on the flint and and the integration of those you know of the of the different technologies the flint and the bone and looking at whether or not you've got use wear evidence for these sort of spatially defined areas of production that's really fascinating thank you okay perfect our next question is for victoria um as far as i understand it you used a new glass pot or melting crucible for every remelt why was this um, so I, I didn't actually use it for each remelt. Um, I used two crucibles in total, um, and they were for the, the the two separate repeats of the experiment. Um, and that was to prevent there being any cross contamination because you can't remove all of the glass from the first five remelting cycles that were one one repeat of the experiment. Um, uh, you know, before doing the second one, you'll never get all that glass out. So I needed to have a completely new crucible so that those two separate repeats of the same experiment uh, didn't cross contaminate each other. But the, but I used the same crucible for each of the five remelting cycles within each experiment, if that makes sense. Mm, okay. And related to the idea of contamination, did you also wash the recycled glass prior to entering it into the crucible on each new melt? Uh, no, but I, I don't think there was any particular reason to do so. 
uh, it, it came straight out of the furnace and was then just broken up and put straight back in. Um, so there shouldn't have been any particular contamination that could have come in um, that would affect the composition of the glass. Okay, no, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is for uh, Andy and Izzy, uh, whoever wants to take this one about the art pieces. Um, were there any particular designs that worked better, so to speak, with the flickering light source? And if so, do you think that some engravings might have been more intended for that purpose than others? Um, I can kick off and then maybe Andy will jump in. Sounds that, good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so we, we didn't really look during the experiment into different designs per se. We were more interested in the heating traces. Um, but what's interesting is with the sort of VR modeling that we're doing, afterwards and I'm currently doing that um, sort of this week as well is um, uh, from the archaeological examples from Monstruck where you have um, sometimes you have these superimposed forms so that might be several horses in different positions almost kind of overlaid on on top of each other um, and it looks quite messy and difficult to pick out when you're looking at the object but as soon as you sort of expose that to this um, dynamic light source that you get from a small hearth, you sort of, it, it seems to have the effect of seeing almost one form and then the other and this almost sense of movement and animation um, to the art pieces. Um, but like I said, we're still sort of looking into that and exploring that further. But I think that's a really exciting um, output of this, um, of our experimental programme. So I don't know if Andy wants to add to that or not. Sure, I'll just add a little to that and um, yeah, just to, to, to agree with that point really. But I think the, the other aspect here as well, perhaps beyond the engraved forms and their particular composition, is the relationship to those engraved forms um, relative to the morphology of the piece of limestone or whatever the, the raw material might be. Um, and in some instances, plaquettes can be quite flat. Um, and you know can still have quite complex compositions on them, but many more pieces um, of this stone are going to be much more um, variable in their particular morphology. And I think it's that um, relationship with light and how that catches, creates shadows, uh, picks out and highlights bumps and changes in that morphology, which can give um, animal forms particular dynamism, in particular um, if they've been positioned with sensitivity to those natural features. So it's a, a theme that we've touched on in our current work, but I think we want to really carry forward as our research continues. I hope that. That addresses the, the question. Yeah, there. no, really interesting. It's similar to, I vaguely remember reading about a cave art thing somewhere where they had a similar uh, idea that they would have drawn it in relation to the actual shape of the rock, uh, something like that. Yeah, so I think that's where some of our ideas are coming from. So my, my PhD is in cave art um, and we're trying to draw these connections. Um, I think I'll just say watch this space because we're currently writing the paper on this and hopefully that'll be out soon without jinxing anything <laughs> <laughs> what a tease <laughs> we have so much to look forward to after this conference so many people have said ah yes i'm working on this it's going oh oh we just want to keep us on tender hooks um okay thank you very much uh, to both of you uh we have a question for sue um polishing of the of the original medieval beads would obviously be quite risky but have the conservators ever immersed them in water to try to more accurately document their original colors Ah, oh, yes. Well, this is a the sort of million dollar question with all the colours of the beads. And well, immersing them in water, I mean, they, they, they're pretty wet when they come out of the ground anyway. And the photographs immediately afterwards um, certainly don't um, indicate much difference. There is, the trouble is it's the surface that decays. And I am so hoping that a nice museum somewhere will let me smash a few beads because all the color is inside. When you occasionally come across a broken bead, you can see a much better example of the color within the bead. And so over time, while well, I've been going around all the museums um, and looking at so many hundreds, probably no, several thousands, I should think even more beads now, is when I get one that's broken, I can usually see the colour. So I, I'm an artist as well. So I take my watercolour paints and I do a precise matching in a little book of any colours I come across. Um, it's a bit like using Pantone, but it's my own personal one for beads and I'm growing it. So yes, it is a problem um, to know exactly what colour beads are, but I think the, the number of colours they had is not that huge. 
And um, if you look at, say, mosaic, glass mosaic, which is very similar glass, um, if you look in the Ravenna mosaics, you can see the brilliant colours as they probably would have looked very similar to what the beads looked like. Okay, thank you. We should do a study and see uh, the pattern of correlation between Sue visiting a museum and the amount of broken glass beads there, just in case. Um, <laughs> I'm actually very interested about that. I also studied, well, I studied amber beads um, previously and also found it much more interesting for to look at broken beads um, indeed than, than whole beads because you could really see the, the perforation clearer. Do you also have issues? I had many issues with um, previous conservation efforts kind of covering the surface. Um, so, I mean, I was doing microwear analysis, so that wasn't possible. Is that something that you also experience when visiting museums? Are there issues of how the beads would have been conserved in the past that affect your current analysis? Um, some of the ones that are on display, I certainly have that, that problem, rather over enthusiastic, they seem to have been varnished. Um, and so you get this false shine on them, which possibly gives you a, the colour, but then the varnish has probably decayed and gone brown. So I, in some ways, it's the opposite. I mean, there are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of beads in museums, in archive. I went to the British Museum to look at the mucking beads, and they are so dusty. I remember being an archaeological illustrator when they were first, had, not long after they had been excavated, and we were drawing them then, and they have now just been crumbling away in their bags. It's impossible to conserve everything, um, which is a shame. But yes, as I say, if one finds a broken one, it's a, a whoop of delight because you can see inside and you can see so much more of how it was made from the inside out as well. Um, I wish that it would be possible in museums to take some of these beads and actually deliberately cut them in half so we could learn a lot more rather than just keeping them in dusty paper bags. Yeah, no, it is a shame, it is a shame. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sue, Sue, sorry. Um, on the subject of, of uh, conserving things and, and uh, making sure we can keep them for the future, uh, talking about the 3D model. Um, so Gianluca or also Rebecca or Marco, whoever wants to answer this, um, how do you account for subjectivity in terms of, for example, modern perceptions of music and sound um, when doing the soundscape project analysis? Uh, Rebecca might have uh, an initial answer. I'm sure Gianluca will have some. Rebecca. Yes, thank you very much for the question. It's actually um, the whole principle of, of soundscape research is taking into account subjectivity. Um, so I guess um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to, uh, to affect how how the how the models uh, are going to be perceived, but we are trying to sort of uh, reproduce them, taking into account uh, context. So we're thinking about uh, how the the space would would have been used, um, and you know the the domestic dimension. So co context really. Uh, is is the important part uh, of 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 a soundscape uh, reconstruction. Um, so I don't know if if Gianluca uh, wants to uh, go for further with that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you very much for for this question. Uh, yes, the problem of subjectivity is very. Uh, important problem. Um, it's a big problem, actually. And um, when talking about any kind of reconstruction, from the visual reconstruction to the reconstruction of sound, actually, uh, it is an issue because uh, our perception of sound and of, uh, of the visual space uh, is deeply influenced by our background. So there are uh, recent researches showing that even the most um, for us obvious uh, facts about musical uh, uh, perceptions, for example, the the uh, the perception of of the interval or the octave actually uh, is not um, uh, is not given for granted. There are cultures where this 
uh, this appreciation of, of, of sound is, is totally different. So uh, this points to the direction that uh, any kind of uh, oral or visual per perception is a, is a social construct. So we have to take into account the, the, uh, the culture we are, we are uh, investigating basically so we have to deal for example with the with the conception of music that these people could have had in the past uh, which was totally different from 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 the current one because uh, they had a, a completely different vision of the world and also I think it is uh, impossible to totally reconstruct this aspect, the, the, the subjectivity of the past. And, but uh, the most important thing to remember is that it is useful for us while, uh, while we reconstruct this, these aspects. I mean, we, we learn uh, about this and, and we open, uh, we, we make more ground for, for wider uh, discussions. I don't know if that answer. Oh, that's definitely. definitely very intense. Thank you very much. We can't, of course, talk about art and subjectivity without referring quickly back to Andy and Izzy. I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on this in relation to your own project. Yeah, yeah, it really resonates, actually. Um, I would say with um, we, ha we have an interest in dynamic, I think, in that the collection, that's the foundation of our work, which is a material from Montestruc, uh, a French Magdalenian site, and it's been stored in the British Museum for a protracted period. It's relatively well studied, and there are really great um, artistic drawings of them, you know, so um, trying to extract the pertinent information from the surface. But captured within that is a particular way of seeing, if you like, so the subjectivities, if you like, kind of come with uh, the drawing process. And on the one hand, it creates a really easy to, um, to work with rendering of the surface, extracted from all the mess of the uh, piece of stone itself. But if you use a method like 3D modeling, in this case, we used uh, white light scanning, so very high resolution um, and very accurate, so sub millimeter accuracy. This almost allows you to reambiguate your surface and kind of see it in a, a different way, how those engravings interact with the stone surface itself. And in particular, where you can manipulate that surface, um, change light positions and so on, really allows you to start to, um, to appreciate more the relationship between the engraving, which we tend to think is the art, and then the engraving as it sits on the rock which I would contend might be a more uh, sensitive way to explore the, the art within a prehistoric context. So I think the, the tool in, in hand here, and I'm not trying to sort of advocate for a simple replacement of, of one again, it's the other, both techniques I would consider to be really valuable. It does allow you to see the material in a different way, I think, which I find really valuable. And in particular with a collection, which has been, uh, is quite well understood, quite well known, it's been quite well studied over its life with a museum context. I think the, the use of a digital technique, such as 3D models, can offer a lot of new avenues for research. And in particular, and here, maybe, maybe Izzy could, could, uh, could join in here it allows us to to use things like 3d mods we've collected several years ago repurpose them and bring in something like vr which has a lot of uh, uh, potential applications as well yeah sort of exactly what um andy said there. um being able to use these 3d models um to then almost place the engraved forms back in their kind of immediate context of how they relate to the stone um and then manipulating that further to explore um, different light levels. Um, if you recolor the, the models to make those engravings a, a fresh white again, how that then changes your um, understanding of the object. I think it's really exciting, um, but I, like, like Andy touched on, I don't think it's as simple as replacing one with the other. And actually they work quite well together because sometimes it's quite useful to be able to see the, the engraved um figures quite clearly which drawings offer particularly when you're then trying to recolor the model and it's difficult to pick out the lines in the 3d model that you have but also equally it's then important to look at that 
within its immediate context and look at how um, that ambiguity of the art almost um, changes um, understanding and interpretation of that object. Hey, thank you so much. This is, uh, I'm really interested in this whole concept indeed of using scientific approaches and more, shall we say, technical methods to look at something like art subjectivity. It seems, uh, seems like things that shouldn't work, but all of your papers have shown how, how well this works, which is really nice. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, okay, our next question is for uh, Jess. Would there be a difference between use where traces created on a hand-driven awl versus, for example, a uh, bow or a pump uh, drill bit, I guess, Andy, as well. This is also for you if you want to add to it, but uh, Jess? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, and one that certainly Andy and I are, are really, really interested in. Um, so really in terms of the, the production of polish, you'll see, we saw certainly with the difference between hand-driven and bow drill, that the bow drill, um, because of the pressure you're able to put behind the tool, um, you can kind of, uh, the, the polish develops kind of more intensively, um, but it's certainly the effort that you need to sort of like half the tool and then use the tool. It just for us seemed a little bit overkill, like you can you can really work quite easily with with a hand held all um, and you don't you know, need to then you don't need to sort of worry about hafting it and, and making sure you've got plenty of adhesives or wrappings around the tool. But we thought perhaps for a sort of larger production of, um, of beads that perhaps hafting would be in the long term, um, of you'd get a better return because obviously you can kind of drill more, more quickly. Um, but generally, the in terms of the microware itself, um, we didn't see a, a vast difference in the, in the production of polish. One thing I would say is that um, we're interested in the idea of tip snapping potentially being more frequent if you are um, hafting the tool, so if you're using a bow drill, um, you might get more, because you're exerting more pressure on it from a downwards force, it might be more likely that you might get tip snapping from that. Um, whereas with the hand, with a hand driven or we didn't see any kind of tip, tip snapping, even with quite hard materials. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're looking into and we're hoping to explore more um, if that answers your question. But Andy as well, who did the experiments can probably add a bit more to that, I'm sure. Sure, I can I can add briefly to that, um, but more just to, to reassert Jess's point there. That I think as with with any set of experiments, there's always more that we would like to try and do, and I'm really keen to um, expand the range of techniques that we try. Most of what we've tried at the moment have been working with all by hand and then um, using a hand drill, almost like you might use a simple fire drill technique, sort of rubbing the stick between your hands, if you like. And I'd like to try and scale this up into bow drill and pump drill. But I'm sort of working in order of what we have the most direct evidence for, archaeologically speaking. Um, so I'm moving from the tool itself, which we definitely have evidence, into we have some hafted examples and some trying different types of haft, and then the bow drill, which is sort of making the greatest leap, if you like as we don't necessarily have uh, preserved examples of those at the site. So we're sort of working through those in order um, and we're very sensitive, as Jess has noted, about the potential changes. So far, it would seem that the rates of polished development might vary by technique, but they tend to come out looking quite the same and they tend to even out the longer the tools are used. And in terms of the beads themselves, because the shell is so soft and so thin, only about three millimetres typically as its average sort of thickness, um, it's really, really quick to make these and really, really simple. And so as Jess says, I think um, probably, you know, making the oil itself might be the more complex job, if you like, in terms of, sort of technical um, skill. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and next question is uh, for Anita. Also, maybe Amy might want to uh, give something or any of the other year um, people. So, um, but Anita, first of all, uh, there seem to be so many opportunities for looking at different materials and technologies um, as a student at, at York, would it be possible for students to engage in projects working with materials or uh, with technologies uh, that are not included in the specialization of the lecturers or the resident researchers? So I don't know who wants to take this, maybe Anita, you can start and see how it goes. Um, I, okay, thank you uh, for the question. I will uh, kick this off by telling you my point of view as postdoctoral researcher, but I think Amy is a better uh, place than me as director of the Year Center to answer. Um, 
I think there is a lot of potential because of the, the way year is structured. For me, I choose the year uh, center to do my research on the well contrast because of the connection and the proximity of the lab and the space. So you, in all the point of being a here is to be able to connect with other people and, and set it up as we grow. It, it has an incredible flexibility. So for example, when I started, um, a lot of the focus was on prehistory and it was expanding to the Middle Ages. Now my research also um, involve uh, ethnographic um, research, not, not only experimental archaeology. And so I, am, I feel very happy to actually be able to contribute to new venue within the ER Center. And this is fantastic. Personally, I have found that everybody there is very helpful to create the connection that are necessary. And there is something very special in knowing that uh, when you are creating for example, a reference collection like mine that is for experimental archaeology for dental calculus research, it will be used by many, many other people from now on. So yes, I, I do believe that uh, the goal of the Year Center, at least by my point of view as a researcher, is to expand temporally and uh, with technology and knowledge. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah you, you've given a perfect answer there, Anita. Exactly, that's what we're trying to encourage. We've We've got a really broad range of research happening now through, you know, throughout pretty much every time period and different materials. So, for example, uh, I, I personally have a PhD student, Mike Groves, who's working on, on woodcraft, and that's not related to my own specialization. Um, it's completely different. But of course, there is that kind of common theme that runs throughout, which is craft. And I think we, a lot of us have that as a point um, in common in terms of our interests. But we're very interdisciplinary. We we work a lot with uh, bioarch researchers as well, so we're interested in sort of scientific applications to experimental archaeology. But uh, increasingly, we're working on digital imaging, as you can see with the work of um, Izzy and Andy. And so integrating all of these different techniques, really, with experimental archaeology, which I see is really exciting and one of our strengths. I'm not sure if that helps answer. No, but yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine, because I can imagine, uh, I guess, as, as a student looking for somewhere, it might be uh, potentially uh, unnerving to decide where to go for if, if you sure. don't see a specialist. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect, um, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm happy to supervise projects which are not specifically re related to my periods of interest or the materials, because I think that experimental archaeology as a methodology uh, you know, is something that is central to pretty much every time period. And we have so many, we're, we're so, we're such a sort of unit now in terms of our research group that we can benefit from the expertise of each other as well. So a student could easily fit in with, with whatever is happening there. And uh, the Year Centre is a really sort of buzzing place to work and we all kind of um, bounce ideas off each other as well. So yeah, it's a very interactive workspace. Okay, great. Thank you. So for all you potential students listening in, do not be put off. You can do whatever you like. Um, okay, thank you very much, uh, Amy and Anita. So the next question is for Anya and for Morten. Um, in some of the clips uh, shown in the presentation, the bone was being worked using uh, leather as sort of protection on, on the leg, um, while in others it was wood, uh, for example. Do you also find archaeological evidence for these byproducts of the manufacturing process? I can, I can start there and then Martin can take over. Uh, no, I think um, what we do have uh, archaeological evidence for uh, are the grinding slabs uh, and the various uh, grinding tools. Uh, but of course, we, we can't know if they were uh, uh, used like this, but uh, uh, I think that's... Um, one of the really good things about uh, experimenting is that you really you see how you experience how things work and that grinding slab sort of almost works like a little table or a very good place to, to work with things. Uh, concerning the skin, that's more for protecting your clothes and uh, 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 we, we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, Martin, do you want to fill in something there? Uh, I can try. Um... 
as you said, uh, we do have evidence for the grinding slabs, uh, and uh, the rest is just uh, protection. And uh, I think also it's it's tedious work. It wears hard on the body, so you need to find your own sitting positions. Probably it varied in prehistory as well. Um, I, I, I guess it's just um, health, environment, and safety, uh, and and doing things in in. Um, in the way you, you find it, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, most comfortable. Uh, si since we don't really know, it's just a matter of like finding good ways of doing it, I guess. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I actually related to this because I mean the the sort of cross craft interaction, shall we say, uh, involved in the whole manu in the in the manufacturing process um, seems quite intricate. So there's so many different types of flint tools, it seems, um, that you use to create just one fish hook. Do you think therefore that the people, the, but the bone workers or the fishermen would have also had their own set of flint tools or would have known how to make the flint tools? Definitely in the Stone Age, or let's say that's like in the Mesolithic and, and in all the periods that we've been studying here, we assume that people will be making their own flint tools. It's a, it's a simple technology, it's flight technology. Uh, you can make most of the tools in uh, 20, 30 seconds if you already have a blank. So it's pretty easy. So you don't need really specialists for the flint mapping. So I think that like these people were quite versatile and they made whatever tools they needed when they needed it. Okay, that's very interesting. Although I like your mention of, oh, it's easy to make a flake speaking as someone who can make flakes very easily. I'm definitely not one of those people. So I would have been a terrible fisherman uh, back in the day, I think. I would say that those uh, experiments, they, they couldn't have, we couldn't have done them without uh, more, you know, universal experience with, uh, uh, with, with so many different Stone Age techniques, uh, because you would never, it, it, it's difficult to uh, in modern times to to gather all those uh, things you need like the especially the grinding tools uh, uh you know they, they come from special areas and you know, it, it has taken more than years to sort of gather all these materials and gather the flint and and uh, i think also Morten, you you say it's very simple but that's because you have 30 years of experience of course exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it, it would have been very simple i suppose for mesolithic people uh who have the experience, but I, I think one important insight, for example, is the uh, the use of microblades. Um, it seems from from how um, we have been proceeding with it that it's sort of the, the thinner the better. So uh, that those kind of tools that are often not considered very interesting, it's uh, you know little uh, broken pieces of microblades here and there, uh, not not given much uh, attention uh, uh, in general, but you really see the value of those tools when you work with bones, because the thin little microblades or bladelets that you can uh, snap off um, the edge when it gets used, then continue to work with it. Uh, it, it works so well, you don't have to haft it or anything, you'll just use it in the hand. Uh, it's, it's sort of an expedient tool, but uh, really I, I think, uh, people were in the past quite conscious about uh, what kind of tools that they were using for for fish hooks uh, in particular, because they're very small. Uh, a lot of them are very very small, uh, so you need a small microblade, and uh, it works well with a small hand uh, and so on. So yeah, it it gives it gives a very interesting insights, I think. Because I also see you mentioned the presence of blanks and sort of preforms in the archaeological record. And if the tools used to make them, especially in those later stages, were a lot smaller, do you think it's possible that uh, they would have been made kind of on site waiting for the fish to bite? Um, or would the fishermen have taken a, a set of completed fish hooks with them? From my experience and um, from, from making these tools, I assume that there's actually something they brought with them. It's too time consuming and you need to have your focus on the fishing, I guess. Like, uh, I think that um, the same as you see in uh, ethnographic studies that uh, uh, when people have idle time uh, and maybe that's also like the reason why they're actually found inside the huts sometimes. That people were actually like in winter, for example, you, you make these things because you have the time. You can't really go outside that much. And, 
And maybe it's, I mean, I mean, these people were all constantly working on something. It's not like today when people have spare time, right? So, so it's, it's actually, I think that the fish hooks is, uh, and harpoon points and all these things in bone and, and antler that maybe, maybe they were uh, produced uh, in social contact texts when people were sitting around the fire just with just enough light and they could keep in a conversation going and you make these things in, in that kind of setting. Uh, so I don't think that they would be doing it while doing the actual fisheries and stuff like that. Okay, no, thank you very much uh, for your answers. Uh, our next question is for Victoria. Um, how were the blown vessels annealed? Uh, and was the glass which was to be recycled annealed at all? Uh, so no, the, the glass was not annealed. Um, so the, the, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one was that it just wouldn't have been possible for me to uh, have been able to uh, build an anne a separate annealing chamber um, and all that. But also there was there's, there is no need to anneal the glass for the questions that I was asking. Um, so I believe in the in the rest of the YouTube comments that the, the person who's asked this question was was saying about uh, that it could affect the composition of the glass. Um, glass is actually incredibly stable, um, but when it's below melting temperatures, it's very inert. Um, so there is very, very, very unlikely that there could be any chemical interaction um, between the, the glass and the furnace in the, the kneeling chamber environment at that point. Um, you could get some surface dulling that has been caused by ash, um, but uh, that would be something that that would be a vessel that has been incorrectly annealed. So you could maybe get small amounts of contaminated glass like that going back into a batch. Um, but most of those vessels would be discarded if that happened. Um, so if, if it's annealed properly, you wouldn't get that surface uh, deposit anyway, and the glass itself compositionally would not change. Um, so it, it, annealing was, uh, was not, there was no point in annealing uh, because in my case, because it wouldn't have affected um, my overall results um, and it would have been an enormous uh, use of resources. So. Yes, no, sounds fair. I see actually, indeed, there's a, a lot of questions for you, um, but I might suggest maybe rather than me going through all of them, um, I know that also the person who asked the questions is on our Discord server. So perhaps you might be able to go there after this and uh, have a more in-depth discussion um, via text. Uh, so apologies, Frank, I'm afraid I won't read out all your questions, but it's very nice to see how interested you are in Victoria's talk. Um, I do, however, have another question for you, uh, Victoria. Um, as a... a ignoramus in, in terms of, of glass making and the sort of chemical compositions. So you did mention in the in the presentation, for example, that a decrease in sodium would then increase viscosity. Um, but what are the practical implications of the sort of changing amount in the other elements present across the five days in relation to those, um, the, the length, softness, homogeneity, et cetera? Um, so uh, when, when we have uh, glass that is made uh, primarily with wood ash um, as opposed to, to natron. Um, those glasses generally are um, uh, shorter, um, so they have a, a shorter uh, sort of working um, range. Um, so you might expect that with significant amounts of contamination by um, uh, potash um, phos and phosphates in particular, that uh, you might end up with a glass that was shorter. Um, and, and therefore you would have less time to work it. Um, but uh, that would probably take a quite significant amount of contamination before you would start to see those effects um, as my experiments are sh kind of showing. Okay, interesting, thank you. Uh, keeping to the subject of glass, uh, we have a couple of questions for Sue. How thick were the chips of Millefiori cane that you used? Were thicker or thinner pieces easier to attach? Right, well, this is a very interesting part of the whole, and it just shows how brilliant experimenting and experimental archaeology is, because I came at it with preconceived ideas, and I found out so much when I varied the different sides of chips. Um, when you've got a cane, a, um, a slice of cane that has got um, little dot, well, s stripes down the side of it, the edges of it, because you've got to think of a cane as a three-dimensional object and you're cutting slices. And so it's a bit like a slice of an orange and on the peel of the orange, there are stripes going down it, which will show as little dots if you just look straight down on the slice. Well, if you cut a thick slice of cane, 
then as you melt it into the bead, the center of the cane sort of implodes. I don't I can't find a technical word for this. The very center sinks into the glass and the sides come up. And so you get a star effect from these stripes around the outside and it completely changes the visual pattern of the cane. So I've been looking at some of these beads to see whether this was done deliberately in, the, in these mosaic beads and the millefiori slices. And I think possibly that they, must, they were, they most certainly did. They would have cut thicker slices so that the pretty patterning on the outside that would only show as dots if you were looking at the section were turning into beautiful starbursts all around it. Um, at first I was very random how I cut the cane slices. I was very bad at it. And sometimes I had thick ones and sometimes thin ones um, using a hammer and hardy to chop them up. Um, but the results, it was good because it meant I got a lot of variety and I was able to see this extraordinary result. Um, just a PS on that, if you apply a slice and then you press it with a knife blade into the bead as you go, then that seems to prevent, it sort of flattens the slice and it seems to prevent the sides coming up quite as much. So you can adjust. But yes, the thickness of the slices has quite a large impact on it. And very interesting question. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, just sort of related to that, I was, by the way, your video was fantastic. Thank you very much for making it all so clear, the process. I really appreciated that. Um, how much time would you say it takes before you kind of master the art of, of this sort of bead making? So, for example, being able to heat all those different layers enough to kind of melt that one in place, but not melt that one and uh, all that kind of thing. Well, I've been working on the hot glass beads. I, I just had one lesson about two years ago, I suppose, um, with a brilliant man who works in hot glass and bead making, um, Mike Poole up in um, Todmorden. And he, after that, we've mostly been in lockdown. So I've been very much on my own and just working at it. I probably work at the glass three or four, three or four to, to eight hours a week, um, and amongst other things. So it, but the millefiori side of things has been the hardest of all. I think of all the crafts that I have done in my life, and I've done a lot of jewellery making and silversmithing and, oh, working on stone and so on and so forth. This has been the hardest of all, and the millefiori is the hardest of all that. Um, the disasters I have had have been absolutely spectacular. Melting bobs, spitting glass, really getting it wrong. Um, much easier to do just adding stringers to make... Um, decorating polychromes or twisties and so on. But the millefiori, wow, that has really, um, I've had to work very hard at it. Do you, out of curiosity, see similar kind of accidents or messed up beads or explosions um, in the archeological record as well? Oh, oh, certainly. Um, I've been looking at a wonderful collection of, of beads from Central Europe just recently with the um, mosaic beads with lots of the canes in, and I can see where they've gone wrong. And this is giving me a fascinating insight. You start seeing handwriting in this very difficult material in the hot glass at this tiny scale. And so where as experts can recognize different people's handwritings, I'm beginning, certainly with the Anglo-Saxon beads, I'm beginning to see the same hand, the way a man or a woman will be adding their decoration and maybe having the same problems and struggling with them. It's, it's all rare, you can, you can see it preserved. I imagine it's also very nice to see that, that uh, these alleged you know, specialists, craft specialists in the past also had the same problems uh, with doing these things. Yes, very, very reassuring. Next question is for uh, the 3D model team uh, at Jarrow Hall, so Gianluca and uh, Rebecca and Marco. Um, so if I understood correctly, in the video it was mentioned that possible alternatives in architectural design um, could also be investigated through adapting, adapting sorry, the 3D model. Um, has this been done already? And if so, what are our, uh, the initial results or observations? I think this one is for Gianluca because I think if I well understood it's about the grandstand which in this moment our, our so it's not an experimental reconstruction what we did there um what, what we inherited there with the grandstand it's just a, a, a mimetic structure 
uh, inspired by the grandstand uh, founded Evering. However, uh, all the coverings in wood uh, are now, they're now um, not in place anymore because they were uh, not properly maintained by the previous management. So um, Gian I think Gianluca can explain what we are trying to do alternatively in, within the project of the general redevelopment of the village. We've got um, funding bids obviously going on to redevelop completely the um, village, which is not a village, but you know what I'm talking about, uh, our open air area. And uh, the entire grandstand situation, the, the, the structure will be modified and improved uh, according to the archaeological record. But Gianluca can tell you why, well, why the 3D um, project is so important for that. Uh, yes, thank you, Marco, and thank you for the question. Um, I think to be, um, to be synthetic, uh, it might be useful to uh, focus for a written moment on the on the grandstand, as as Marco said. Uh, what what we tried to do already uh, has been like uh, considering different options for the stage at the grandstand based on the archaeological uh, excavation. So in the area of the stage, uh, there were found several uh, post holes indicating the the presence, probably the the presence of screens behind the, the stage area uh, of wooden screens or, or something like that. And when we add these screens to the model, uh, um, it, it can be done really easily in, in, in AutoCAD and then transfer the, the, the result in the, in the audio software to simulate the, the acoustics. We see that it completely changes the the acoustic of the site for example uh, especially uh, the the voice of the uh, of a person speaking uh, for this uh, uh, from the stage area is reinforced uh, considerably from from that point from the presence of the of the screens there are a couple of slides uh, in the in the in the a presentation about this actually. Um, other things that we are currently doing is to investigate different aspects. For example, in the in the third building, uh, from an archaeological point of view, uh, considering, for example, the the presence of a different um, a configuration of the windows, and also we can try to investigate the the light inside of the building because we know that. Uh, the building that was found at Thurlings at a different uh, orientation. So that changes a lot in terms of light inside the, the building. So we, we can try all of these different options. Uh, we, it, it is rare, as I said before, that we get to a, uh, a single answer, but at least we have a we we can consider equally all of the different options without uh, putting too much emphasis on just one that might be uh, only partial. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered. <laughs> no, that sounds uh, very clear indeed, yes. And like you say, it's then nice because you don't have to spend all the time and effort in building something just to see how it would be, you can just do it through, through yes. digital methods. Yes, and and if you choose to then to realize uh, a new experiment, uh, you can have a um, background with the, with the digital models to see which kind of uh, questions you are going to address with the, with the new experiment and, and with the new construction. So you can try to, uh, make some predictions, let's say, and then test them whether, uh, to, uh, to see whether they work or, or not. This is yeah. very useful, I think. Definitely, <laughs> definitely something. I think uh, we've had a lot of talks about house building and, and that sort of thing here. So I think that would be something that would be very useful for other projects as well, uh, probably. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much thank uh, you. to the Jarrow Hall team. <laughs> um, <laughs> next question is for uh, Anita. Um, you mentioned wear on the teeth, uh, especially in relation to their use as a third hand. C 
Could you elaborate uh, on this? Uh, the questioner has said, I've seen some effects on teeth from pine needle basket weaving. Uh, so what crafts have you identified? Um, okay, this is a very complex question because we are, this is, and is part of the reason why I'm looking at micro debris in calculus, because dental wear can be the result of multiple activities, sometimes the combination, and it's also linked at how hard the material was in different places, in different periods of time, people put through the mouth different things. So we can only grasp an idea that people were using um, the um, the teeth for certain crafting activity, but without really narrowing down with great precision what they were, and some maybe still unknown. So I found particularly interesting and particularly useful now trying to develop um, an idea of what, uh, for example, textile fiber, what type of textile fiber enter uh, the, um, the mouth during textile processing and work, or also basketry, what type of debris produce, and if we can try to link it to specific type of craft like, for example, basketry, uh, in, in conjunction with dental wear that may be not super diagnostic for that specific craft. There is a lot of work to do because in different places around the world, people use different material. So we're just beginning here. But there are a lot of potential. I think one of the things that is very interesting now, at least in my field and with experimental archaeology, is really beginning to look at the connection of these flux of particles into the mouth during crafting activity and how they can be, if retrieved from ancient material, how they, be, they can be worked in with other line of evidence from the skeletons and from the calculus itself to really strengthen our interpretation. Did I answer your question? Is that enough? I, I think so. That sounds very, very filling. Um, uh, Questioners are usually quite good at following up in case it hasn't been answered. So we will keep an eye on the on the Discord and see if they ask a question again. Um, thank you, Anita. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Jessica. Would you consider experiments with multiple drillers to allow for differences in technique between the experimenters? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, I guess by multiple drillers, you mean multiple experimenters? Yes, I think that, that yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds good. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting point. Um, it's something that we we haven't looked into just because, I mean, Andy, um, as he mentioned in the in the presentation, he has lots of experience, and so we're really, I guess, looking for more about. Um, we're, we're kind of keen on working with people that have an understanding of the material, and the way that you can work the material. And I think, obviously, Andy with his experience, and he can speak more to this probably um, after after I finished trying to answer the question. Um, but yeah, I think it was more about having someone that has experience of the materials and sort of the limits of the materials and, and the production methods. Um, I think variability in, in using different drillers is something that we could definitely look into. Um, although I think at the moment, we're more interested in trying to look at the variability of microwear production between materials and between production techniques, rather than variation in sort of human action. Um, but as yeah, as I said, that certainly is, is another area. I think with this with it, with this topic and with these experiments, Andy and I have found that there are so many avenues that you can go down and so many rabbit holes to, to go down um, that you can sometimes get a little bit lost. So we're trying to keep focused, but that's definitely uh, yeah a possible future avenue to look look further um, into. And I'm not sure, Andy, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Jess says, I think, um, you know, the more we look into this, the more interesting it gets, really. And with alls in particular in the site that we're looking at at Star Car, we've started to realise that there's a real diversity of use with this tool as well from the point of view of the contact material. So um, we're trying to diversify the range of materials that we're trying to use beyond just uh, beads on the one hand. And I'm sure as our research progresses and as Jess has articulated, this would be a really great area to bring in as well to see quite how different people might attack the same problem, the tools that you might want to use um, and so on. So I think it would be a really valuable addition as we continue to try and expand the project um, and think about the relationship between particular tool forms, um, their particular setup and uh, you know whether they need to be hafted or so on. At a site like Starcar, we have evidence for both, if they're a more specialist tool or not, and then absolutely the range of experience that the experimenter might be able to bring to bear. 
uh, will be a really valuable uh, contribution moving forward, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I mean, related to that, Anya and Morton. Um, so if I understand correctly, Morton was the kind of central experimenter, shall we say, but you also mentioned uh, investigating skill uh, as, as a idea um, within your research. So perhaps you might want to uh, add something to this uh, based on your own experiences. Yes, um, since we started with the fish hooks, I was uh, the completely unskilled one and uh, had never done it before. Uh, so um, I had originally uh, an idea for a research project to uh, try to investigate skill uh, more thoroughly by, you know, bringing in uh, a range of people to to try it and uh, you know to. To make tests to see how how quickly can you learn it can children learn it and so on but we we haven't got so far yet so uh, so far uh, the investigations into the skill is based on you know how i'm progressing with doing it um no pressure and I, then <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i have to say it's i it uh, it takes time to to master it uh definitely it it, it does take some skill but I mean, that's what, of course, when you are starting with it, uh, when you're a grown up, uh, it's very different to a prehistoric situation where uh, you would learn this kind of craft from a very young age. Uh, it would probably not be very difficult to do it. Uh, so so it's a bit difficult in that sense to, to get uh, a good grip on the skill. Um, but I think also a lot of... Uh, the work has shown that even time is maybe even more uh, an issue than skill, especially when it's the um, the Mesolithic fish hooks, the, the Neolithic ones are uh, definitely more complicated to make. But the issue of time, I think, is very important in these actualistic experiments. You really get the sense of how much time it takes compared to, for example, uh, making uh, some flint flakes. Uh, sometimes we, we have been laughing about, you know, whether it should be not uh, stone age, but uh, grinding age, that they have, must have spent a lot of time uh, grinding. And you, and you also see this when, when you look at the sites more, um, you know, the overall activities at uh, uh, Mesolithic coastal sites in Norway. Uh, grinding is also very important in uh, stone technology. You have a lot of uh, uh, stone axes which have been grinded. So, so I think people have been able to work back and forth between different uh, material categories. I'm sliding off from the skill there now, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I noticed that. Avoid it. Avoid it. No, thank you. That's a, no, that's a very interesting answer. I don't know, Morten, if you have anything you wanted to add to that? I kind of think that uh, most of it was covered and I drifted a little bit. So. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, no, I think Anya covered it uh, quite well, I think. Perfect. Well, that's always uh, always nice. Uh, while I have you both here, though, uh, I have some more questions. Um, sometimes the lower jawbone of animals, so cattle or maybe deer, um, has been used in the production of fish hooks as well, as the part near the joint has a useful shape for that. Have you tried this? No, never. And, and the reason is, uh, in our area, research area, like Scandinavia, you don't find any evidence for it. I know that uh, people make them uh, in experimental studies elsewhere, but uh, for us, it's more like we focus on, on, the, on the archaeological material that we have. So, no. Okay, no, that's a very clear answer. Thank you. Um, a little bit of a more broad question. Do the different fish hook practices allow you to infer different kinds of uh, fishing styles or differences in the role of fishing um, within the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition? Well, obviously, um, it looks like uh, the Mesolithic fish hooks are made for uh, mostly for um, uh, local fisheries, like small fish, like, uh, I, I don't know exactly the English word for that kind of fish, but it's the most common fish that you can, like anybody can just catch it. Uh, and, and I think that like the, the, the bigger hooks on the Neolithic, they, they, they seem to be like more focused on, uh, on uh, like real serious fisheries, deep water fisheries. 
so, so it, it seems a little more prepared and organized and uh, skillful in a way. Okay, thanks. I don't yeah. know if you want to add to that, Anya? Or... Yeah, I think what we, what we see in the uh, archaeological material, there are two really basic uh, differences. The Neolithic hooks are, well, they're made in a completely different way, and they're often much bigger. You have also at the Neolithic sites a uh, variety in sizes, but you have in, in general some really large size hooks, uh, which I think might have been used. Like we, th There is evidence for fishing of uh, uh, bluefin tuna, for example, a uh, really big fish. Um, that would be a type of fish which you could, which you could also take by harpoon, but... Uh, uh, I think it might indicate that they were going a bit for the bigger fish uh, in the Neolithic. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for your answers. Uh, Victoria, I have a question, I suppose, aimed at you, but more about um, XRN rather than uh, necessarily the, the glass research. Um, so what advice would you give to other experimental archaeology students or groups of students who want to start their own more official organization um, at their own universities? And also what, what would you have done differently uh, in the creation of Exxon as a group? Um, Marco, do you want to chime in on this one I as was well? going to ask if Marco was uh, also <laughs> involved in this, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, me and Victoria, we were uh, both there when we um, created Exxon. Um, uh, what are we? What would have we done differently, Victoria? I don't know. What have we? I think so. The most important thing, and and ask Victoria if she agrees with me, is um, to have a good team. You need to have a good team um, initially, most of all, because um, you need to create the proper network. You need to um, present the project within the department. You need to speak about your project within the department and make sure that lecturers and, and members of staff, because at the end of the day, our group um, is made by students and it's a student-led group. So um, we needed that um, staff support to officialize a little bit better uh, the group, to um, access funding opportunities and so um, this is really important the network within within the department and then secondarily obviously to expand the network outside as we did initially uh, organizing the conference um, east and then uh, you know now a conference which now is um, is a traveling conference as we say um, and then another second important point uh, I think is, the connection with uh, a museum or an open space, an area that you can actually use uh, for the experiments, not only for the experiments though, I'm a, a, a strong believer in uh, an, a complete cycle of the experimentation, which starts obviously with the research, with the questions, but also takes the opportunity to be transformed in an event, in an occasion of um, education and communication for the public. So um, we established that connection with uh, Jarrah Hall since the beginning, even before establishing officially Exxon. And I think that's really important. I imagine our colleagues from the ES Center will, uh, will agree on that, uh, as obviously um, they also have an open, an open area. In Newcastle University, uh, we don't have uh, a specific area dedicated to experimental archaeology, and this is why we, uh, we established since the beginning this relationship with Jarrah Hall. Um, there are some projects uh, uh, to expand our relationship. Victoria, if you want to mention that. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're currently working, uh, well, um, uh, Newcastle University uh, staff are currently working uh, on setting up a, a permanent experimental area. Um, so one thing I was going to say in regards to um, it's kind of advice for setting up uh, your, yourself as a group more officially. Um, so we weren't able to set ourselves up as sort of an official uh, research group within the university. Uh, because there isn't really a mechanism to do that as, as students. Um, and that may well be the case uh, at, at other institutions. 
Um, but what we have been able to do is affiliate ourselves with, with MATCH, which is a, a faculty uh, research uh, uh, group. Um, and uh, by doing that, that's basically allowed us to, uh, to kind of have this more official standing. Um, so if there is sort of a pre-existing um, research group, uh, particularly I would say if you could find one at faculty level, um, that uh, your that your sort of experimental group would fit into their sort of wider remit, then affiliating yourselves with them um, is a really good route to go if you can't um, set yourselves up as sort of uh, an independent official uh, research group, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent advice. So for all of you students uh, out there, there's there's hope to, to start your own official group as well. Uh, I have a question for, I'm not sure if it would be best for Jan, uh, Gianluca or for Rebecca, um, but uh, have you also had live concerts or recitals at Jarrow Hall um, or the other sites as a comparison with the results of the 3D model experiments? So not yet, uh, but we that's what we're aiming to do. Um, to sort of also integrate uh, music performances in the in the model, we want to like record in situ with with binaural instruments, but also have anechoic recordings to introduce in the in the model. Maybe Gianluca can can uh, explain this a little bit better. Um, yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, we we are aiming for the part concerning Odeon, uh, further to, to the uh, binatural recordings that Rebecca mentioned, uh, to record some uh, anechoic tracks using, for example, uh, experimental reconstruction of irremediable instruments or um, passages recited in Old English or uh, things like that, and to test all of these sounds in the different parts of the building of the buildings and with different uh, architectural options so to see for example uh, whether the the speech in transmission index so the uh, or the clarity of the speech was good enough or was better in certain points of the buildings or in other points of the building so uh, the auditorium software, uh, which we are using for, for these uh, experiments, uh, digital experiments, um, um, allows for running uh, anechoic uh, recording. So basically tracks where uh, we have no reverberation at all to simulate the, the reverberation in the digital room. Um, and and again, this will present us with a series with a series of options, and we can explore uh, all of the different options. So far, for example, we have seen that the the Thurlix Building A is a very uh, dry building. It has no reverberation basically, and and is a uh, oh, very 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 low. Uh, reverberation at this, and it has no previous point. So wherever you speak inside the building is 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 more or less the the same for the audience. While the grandstand is is completely different, uh, especially with the with the screens that seem to have been uh, detected in the in the archaeological excavations. Uh, I hope that answered. <laughs> Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, did you want to say something else? Yeah, just a, uh, um, one little thing from a from a volunteering point of view or from a stakeholder point of view. Um, to do these recordings, we involved um, uh, two of our um, volunteers uh, who are members of um, the Friends of the World of Bid, which is our sort of academic group of volunteers, more academic group of volunteers dedicated to the Anglo-Saxon uh, archaeology. Archaeology. They're members of Reg Anglorum, so Living History Group. They uh, do uh, reproduce, let's say, reinterpret uh, what could have been uh, some uh, early medieval music. And uh, um, Gianluca uh, managed to um, organize the recordings at Newcastle Uni um, through the Department of Musicology, if I'm not wrong. So this is just to say that 
um, from a from a research project which starts from a specific question uh, or a set of specific questions, um, in terms of a project for an open air museum like ours, uh, this uh, creates a series of opportunities for a series of scholars, of volunteers, members of the public to all contribute in the research. And I see it uh, a little bit in the end, I see it as a little bit of a community project. Okay, uh, Amy, you see you would like to comment on this? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think it's really important to have staff involvement because um, just, I think really for a continuity perspective as well, if, if you want to set up an organization, an experimental group, for it to continue and to continue to have strength, I think you need to have permanent members of staff who are involved in that, who can carry it forward. So I would say that's one of the tips I'd give. And I think that, you know, the, the proximity as well is really a really important thing for these centers to be able to have them on campus um, with access to, to the different labs, et cetera, I think really opens up so many more kind of research opportunities if and where possible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, Amy, I, I did have uh, one last question um, for you. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of experimental archeology span as we've sort of seen is, can be quite physically demanding or you need a lot of skill for it, um, but also mentally uh, rewarding as is pointed out in the, in the video that uh, you and a couple of the others from the Year Center uh, presented. How do students or other participants in your workshop or, or your crafting events initially react to the activities they undertake? And how would you encourage, for example, uh, professors or lecturers at other universities to encourage students um, in experimental archaeology? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, this is really, I mean, this work is very exploratory. So we're just trying to, I mean, Anita's work is very much um, focused on physical health, but we've realized that experimental archaeology does have a role to play in, in mental health as well. And that's really just through, through our own teaching uh, practice and sort of reflective work where we see how it has a positive impact. And I mean, I think it's just that kind of hands-on practice-based work, um, working outdoors, interacting, socializing with each other has a, has a really strong role to play in all of that. Andy, are you there? Did you want to talk about your work this year? Sure, yeah. So um, obviously this year adds interesting challenges for all of us who are involved in experimental archaeology, whether in terms of research specifically or teaching specifically, or indeed research-led teaching, depending on the particular configuration you might be working on at a given time. And of course, with a new group of students moving into a new uh, new environment, a new city, a new workplace, etc. Um, that adds interesting new challenges in this as well. And so I think from, um, you know, working anecdotally, as, as Amy rightly says, this is exploratory work here, something that we've been sensitive to from the inception of the centre moving forward. Um, with our new cohort of students in particular, this was a really important opportunity where the activity itself, the, the act of doing, of making, uh, of working within a community environment, working collaboratively within on, on tasks that might not be completely familiar, um, was, was a really formative experience, I think, where a lot of other avenues for socialisation, for network building and so on, might have been... Um, uh, negotiated differently, typically on more in more online formats. So it seems to have been a really important um, opportunity for students. And that is perhaps being particularly easy for us to see this in this particularly strange environment we find ourselves in. Um, and I think sort of building out from that, it seems uh, an interesting question for us all to ponder, perhaps, in that when we're trying to do these experiments, when we start to zone in, if you like, we start to get lost in the activity itself, what does this really say about uh, our minds? What does it say about the relationship between activities of this kind and health? As much as it might take um, a particular demand of the physical body, it's all evidently interacting with the mind somehow as well. And so I think in this exploratory research that we have started, we're kind of interested in, in both sides of that equation, really, in every context, whether it's about research and how we engage with what we do and perhaps how, uh, in my case, ancient hunter-gatherers engage with what they did, um, um, and, and our students learning this for the first time and how they learn about uh, creating uh, objects and uh, the process uh, of doing that. 
Thank you. I was uh, just uh, one last thing before we wrap up. Sue, as a as an independent researcher, um, do you have any any sort of input on this uh, or from from your own experience from the other side, shall we say? Well, I suppose um, I was very much enjoying going out and before we had the pandemic and uh, connecting with people that I had known from years before. And the experiments seem to really reach out to more than just archaeologists. People get very fascinated at, the, at this idea of trying to get into the souls of the long ago peoples. And well, personally, I, I've been saddened that I haven't been able to contact I would continue with my trekking around all the museums of Europe pretty well so that's on pause at the moment hopefully to continue but uh, this conference has been wonderful and I have very very much enjoying so much all this connection with everybody again so thank you so much. I think uh, I'll finish it there thank you very much to all our speakers